Uh, the webinar series that we start today belongs to these webinar efforts that uh, Europractice is making. And in this case, as I was mentioning at the beginning, we are going to talk about the multi-project wafer services from IMEC Technologies. So today, uh, our speaker, uh, speaker Adil Masood will talk about Biopix, IMEC Silicon Nitride Photonics Platform. Then in two weeks, we will learn more about IMEX Silicon Photonics MPW service with Dr. Mulham Holder. And finally, for the last episode, Dr. Mimala Chatterjee and Maritza Tangari Fiortiz will focus on gallium nitride on SOI technology for highly integrated GANISIS. So with this, I would like now to introduce the speaker and then I will give Adil the floor to begin his presentation. So Adil Masood got his master's degree and bachelor's degree in photonics from Koshin University in India. And after that, he joined IMEC and, uh, IMEC and Ghent University as a researcher in silicon photonics. And he worked in many different domains like uh, integration, metallization or thermo optic uh, tuning. Adil was also the coordinator of the IMEX Silicon Nitride Photonics multi-project wafer runs for the European project Pix for Life. And currently he is responsible for the multi-project wafer service on IMEX Silicon Nitride Photonics. So now I would like to invite Adil to the stage and I wish you all a very nice webinar. Adil, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for a nice uh, introduction. Um, I hope my uh, voice is coming clear. And uh, OK, yes. so uh, welcome everyone for uh, our first webinar in the Euro practice series. And uh, without further uh, ado, let's uh, jump uh, directly into uh, this presentation. So uh, based on lots of attendance that uh, we, we have a very uh, healthy attendance today um, and uh, from the registration records and uh, uh, I can see that uh, there are many people with photonics background and many of them who are from, from bulk photonics ba background, not integrated photonics or even uh, outside photonics domain. So uh, a quick slide about what photonic integrated circuits are and what exactly are we talking about? Uh, because this webinar and the one following this uh, on silicon photonics is all about integrated photonics. Uh, in particular. So we know uh, uh, that how an optical fiber works. Uh, it's a very basic uh, total internal reflection uh, which carries light through the wire, the core of the wire. And the basic principle underlining its operation is the fact that the core where light travels is of higher refractive index compared to what surrounds the core, uh, which we call cladding. So there is a refractive index uh, difference between the core and the cladding, which allows light to keep getting uh, internally reflected and propagated. So optical fibers are uh, in in research and in industry for for, for decades, and uh, uh, they have a very uh, stable and uh, dominant position when it comes to optical communication uh, from intercontinental level down to the rack to rack communication. Um, the question was that can the same principle be applied um, uh, and uh, on an on an integrated chip? So there, that's where integrated photonics comes in. Its working principle is basically same as of, uh, of fiber optics. Um, you can see uh, over here that this is a diagram of what a typical waveguide look, looks like. Um, here the material is silicon and silicon dioxide, but generally speaking, it can be any two material with different refractive index. In this case, uh, silicon has a higher refractive index than silicon dioxide. So that means that this uh, rectangular waveguide functions like an optical fiber. And if you look at this image, the top image shows uh, uh, an electron microscope uh, cross section image of a waveguide uh, with the silicon dioxide at the bottom, silicon waveguide and air at top of it. Um, any other low refractive index material can also be put as a clad uh, other than air and it will still function as it is. And uh, this image shows uh, uh, electromagnetic uh, field distribution showing how the mode or where is the density of uh, light in the core. 
So uh, that means that we can use the same principle and uh, use uh, and put uh, optical operations on a chip. But uh, how does it help and what advantages do we get? So first of all, based on this principle, there can be many different kind of waveguides which can be fabricated. There are some examples shown here, but uh, uh, by design engineering, many other uh, kind of designs can also be uh, attained. This is just to show as an example. Um, <clears throat> for example, this waveguide is somewhere where a, a, a high index, uh, high defective index material is surrounded by a low index material from all, all the sides. Uh, this is a diff different uh, uh, architecture where uh, there is air as a cladding. Uh, this is more like a wire waveguide where you can see and then many different variations. For example, rib waveguides, they are also very popular uh, depending on different kind of uh, operations. Two waveguide, very close and parallel called, called slot waveguides. And these different types of waveguide architectures have different uh, applications. They are good for different kind of uh, things. But uh, the basic principle again remains the same. Uh, now we can make waveguide. Fine. What's the next step? Why not make uh, integrated circuit, a photonic integrated circuit out of it. Again, this is a simple example uh, which shows how a typical photonic integrated circuit uh, might look like. Uh, what you see here is uh, something different optical waveguides, but some other uh, components on it as well. For example, uh, these pink boxes, they show photodiodes. So any light moving through this waveguide uh, and uh, diverted towards photo, photodiodes will of course perform optical to electrical conversion and hence uh, an optical power can be measured on chip. It is also possible to put on chip laser or on chip light source, though it is uh, uh, it's not possible to generate lots of optical power through it. Uh, so often light is inserted from outside in a chip and then that light up uh, now only imagination is the limit uh, on, on the question of what you can do with the uh, photonics waveguides. You can make uh, different kind of uh, uh, interferometers like here it is shown as an as an MZI interferometer, uh, ring resonators which can act like a filter. You can use these devices to modulate light by uh, applying uh, current to it. Uh, and and, and these, there are many, many applications we can go to. So that's a quick slide on what photonic integrated circuit is. Now, we if we there's one lesson we want to take from this slide and um, uh, then it is just that integrated optics like fiber optics is based on total internal reflection but what gives integrated optics additional benefit is that it can be monolithically made on a chip just like uh, electronic ICs are made uh, uh, that gives us extreme compactness repeatability and we will see what all other benefits there are so Coming back to the question, silicon nitride integrated photonics, why silicon nitride? Uh, why not other materials? So first have a look about what all photonics applications uh, exist out there. Um, and to look at that, we have to see what are the different wavelengths uh, involved. And so as you know that there are lots of different phenomena in the world which corres corresponds to different wavelengths of uh, light. And uh, if we put all these applications on a spectrum from visible uh, going up to infrared domain, then then you can see that there are different wavelengths or different wavelength ranges which are uh, good for different kind of applications. For example, uh, we know that 1550 and 1310, these are the wavelengths uh, in, in O band and C band of communication are uh, intensively used for uh, optical fiber communication. Uh, a more extended range is used for uh, microwave photonics. Then um, uh, remote sensing is performed uh, with the wavelength range starting from one micron going up to uh, a few microns. And then uh, different kind of chemical sensing for industry or biology. It mostly lies in uh, visible range or uh, near infrared. Then um, optical coherence tomography used for uh, uh, eye scanning and all largely falls in near infrared. Quantum processing and quantum computing is a um, uh, rapidly emerging field and uh, and we see that uh, there are a, l a very large wavelength range on which 
uh, quantum processing uh, related uh, phenomena can be uh, made into applications. Uh, precision metrology and spectroscopy that largely falls into visible and near infrared and lots of uh, bio related uh, applications uh, which falls into visible range. So pretty much whole spectrum from visible light uh, up to uh, almost mid infrared is uh, something which is of interest when it comes to uh, integrated photonics. Uh, now, of course, this uh, wavelength range can be larger, uh, the, just like electromagnetic spectrum, which extends um, very large in both the directions. The applications can be infinite, but uh, we are focusing mainly on visible and um, infrared region. Uh, and the reason is something very central, which I will come to it in the next slide. But lesson to draw from this slide is that diverse application domains for visible and infrared uh, domain uh, spectrum exists. And uh, that brings a question that what material should be used for photonic integrated circuits? Now, um, if we want to play with light in visible and uh, in uh, infrared domain, we will prefer a material which is transparent in for, for these wavelengths. And then if you look at the spectrum again, we have just uh, noticed that uh, life science related applications are largely in visible range. Uh, then communication related applications at 13, 10 nanometer and 15, 50 nanometer uh, falls uh, after that. And then for uh, longer wavelength, there are lots of applications in chemical sensing. Broadly speaking, this division exists. Now, if you look at silicon, then you see that uh, it's uh, it is transparent somewhere from 1.1 micron onwards, uh, and that broadly tells that silicon can be used for materials uh, uh, where uh, can be used for applications where uh, wavelength involved is higher than 1.1 uh, micron. But if you look at silicon nitride's transparency range, then it goes down to 400 nanometers. Uh, that pretty much covers the whole uh, visible spectrum, but also the infrared spectrum. So that means that silicon as well as silicon nitride, both are very good material if you want to make photonics application in the range of visible and infrared. Um, though silicon nitride seems to have an edge over silicon, it covers uh, more wavelengths. And that is the lesson you should take from this slide, that silicon is transparent for infrared, but silicon nitride is not only transparent for infrared, but also for visible. Now, we have talked about why silicon nitride is important, uh, or why silicon and silicon nitride both are good candidate for that. Uh, we also had a glimpse of how waveguides look like. Now, I will take this approach to directly show that how Biopix, which is the name for uh, IMEX silicon nitride photonics platform, how its chips are made. Um, this quick uh, uh, description of fabrication steps will also give an idea about how integrated photonics circuits in general are made and um, what new innovations can be implemented in it. So to start with uh, um, in at IMAC uh, for Biopix platform, uh, these chips are made on a 200 millimeter wafer because the processing happens in a CMOS fab um, and uh, it's a wafer level processing, pretty much similar processing as uh, which exists for ASIC chips or for, uh, for electronics. Um, and if you are using a CMOS fab, then obviously silicon uh, wafer is the material of choice because most of the equipments and tools uh, have been uh, <clears throat> adjusted for it, evolved for it over, over many decades. Uh, so uh, silicon is the most favorite material in the clean room uh, for a CMOS fab. So that uh, that's the best material to use as a substrate. That's not necessarily the wave guiding layer. That material we come to come to it later. But in the very first step of the fabrication step is to take a substrate. And for a CMOS fab, the natural choice is a silicon wafer. The crystalline silicon wafer from which the processing starts. And then, of course, there is a deposition of uh, various layers. Uh, um, now, in this case, uh, a layer of silicon dioxide is deposited, followed by silicon nitride. And uh, that already gives uh, silicon nitride an underlying material which is of lower ref refractive index 
than uh, silicon nitride. The next step is uh, patterning of silicon nitride waveguide. This step involves um, photolithography, etching, um, at, and the, the cycle happens uh, a few times to give different uh, topology to, to the waveguides. But uh, as you can see that uh, the waveguides are now um, already sandwiched between two low refractive index materials, silicon dioxide at the bottom and air above. In next step, a clad silicon dioxide is put uh, on top of these waveguides. That does not really change um, bring any change in, in, in performance of these waveguides, uh, but uh, uh, it allows manufacturing of uh, or uh, further layers on top of this stack. And of course, uh, give protection to these these waveguides. Um, this step is followed by deposition of metal layers and their patterning, which includes again lithography and etching. And uh, in the case of biopics, two different metal layers are put. As you can see, a uh, dinitrite uh, layer, which is used for thermo-optic heating, it's uh, used as a microheaters, and to connect this layer. With the um, with the uh, with power sources outside, this aluminium layer is uh, used, which is which acts uh, a bit like uh, metal one layer in in CMOS. Uh, uh, if if you take the analogy from uh, CMOS chip, um, this step is followed by two deeper edge. Uh, one which selectively and locally opens uh, removes oxide from top of some of the waveguides. Now. That's not uh, useful for all the applications, but there are many applications, um, especially regarding sensing or in microfluidics, where you want your sensing material to touch waveguide directly. So obviously you have to remove oxide, uh, but not from all over the chip, but only from uh, selected places, like it's uh, shown over here. And another step is a deep etch, uh, which uh, an etch which goes all the way, not just removing the deposited material, but also going deep into uh, crystalline uh, silicon. This deep etch step uh, allows coupling of uh, or alignment of optical fibers to these waveguides directly to uh, to do input and output of light. So uh, this is a very um, helicopter view of the fabrication steps for uh, uh, biopics or in general for um, photonic integrated circuits. And then in the end, we receive the finished wafer. Now, as I as I stressed before that, even though it is a biopics uh, fabrication steps, so more or less similar steps exist for uh, other integrated photonics for uh, based on other material like silicon or even even uh, three five materials. Uh, it differs in a sense that uh, in the case of, uh, as we will see in, in, in webinars in, in the next webinar, that uh, because silicon is a crystalline material, we can manipulate its properties by doping it. And uh, different kind of implants, uh, of course, already exist in a CMOS flow. Um, so those same implants can be used on silicon waveguides, changing their electro optical properties and then making them as modulators or detectors and, and so on. Something like that does not exist for silicon nitride because uh, it's an amorphous material um, and it's strictly speaking not really a semiconductor. So doping silicon nitride will not dramatically change its uh, electro optical properties. Um, but uh, there are of course uh, other benefits of silicon nitride which uh, makes it a strong contender to work in complement with uh, silicon uh, as a photonic material. So lesson from this slide is that uh, photonic integrated circuit fabrication with CMOS technology is possible. It's done repeatedly and it has its own benefits, pretty much similar benefits which exist for uh, IC production using CMOS, CMOS technology are uh, very much relevant for uh, PIC or photonic integrated circuit manufacturing as well. So, what is the material stack for biopics? How does it look like? So you already have an idea how, how does it look like, but if I go into more detail, uh, this is one cross section which shows uh, that uh, how the waveguide layer of uh, biopics looks like, what are the material above it? So starting from the waveguide layer, you can see that 
there are two different uh, edge depths now uh, to which these waveguides can be etched. Uh, they can be etched partially uh, or completely. So as we have seen in the very first slide, there are different ki kind of waveguide architectures which exist, uh, uh, like a ridge waveguide or a rib waveguide. So all those kind of different waveguides can be made using combination of these two uh, edge steps. Uh, then of course there are metal layers, uh, tinacrite metal layer for thermo optic. Uh, you, it uh, acts as a microheater and uh, aluminum layer to connect it <coughs> uh, for rerouting the electrical connections or connecting it with the <coughs> electrical sources up there. Um, there is also removal of oxide locally to expose waveguides to whatsoever sensing material you want to uh, use it with. And of course, deep edge to allow access, uh, fiber, fiber access to the waveguides using edge coupling. Uh, this other diagram shows a 3D perspective of uh, uh, you know, of uh, biopics and also different uh, kind of <coughs> devices which can be made using this stack. Uh, you can already see example of a rib waveguide here, uh, a strip waveguide. Then of course there is a heater uh, which can be used on top of waveguide. So if if you heat a waveguide locally you are basically changing its uh, refractive index locally and almost all uh, I mean a lot of application in uh, integrated photonics is about uh, are achieved by just manipulating the refractive index locally. Um, and then of course uh, this deep edge allows the edge coupler and the bond pad clad opening as I mentioned before. So Biopix stack offers uh, passive devices, uh, passive devices which does not require active uh, electrical or uh, or any kind of uh, changes. They, they just exist without it. And also thermo optical tuning, uh, which can be achieved using the microheaters up there. What are the main features of Biopix, uh, which gives it the strength? So far we have been talking in generalities about uh, uh, the stack and, and and what different kind of material it has. But uh, if I go into further uh, specifics of uh, Biopix platform, so its uh, biggest strength is that it is uh, based on a, a CMOS uh, technology. So 200 millimeter wafers are uh, used and the same tools which are used for making uh, electronic ICs are used for making these chips. Uh, it's a 118 nanometer node CMOS technology which allows uh, very low critical dimensions, so uh, very small photonics features can be made uh, using this, and it has high system compactness because of that. Um, then the silicon nitride, which is used in Biopix, is PECVD uh, silicon nitride. Now, uh, there are many different kind of silicon nitrides. Uh, there are many different kind of uh, chemical vapor deposition techniques through which silicon nitride uh, can be um, deposited. Uh, PECVD and LPCVD are two very uh, uh, popular methods for deposition of silicon nitride. Um, both methods have different pros and cons, um, and, uh, and uh, uh, that's why they are used for different kind of applications, different kind of thicknesses of silicon nitride. Biopix is based on PECVD. Uh, silicon nitride and that gives it some advantages. Uh, one thing is that it is a low temperature deposition, which means that uh, the temperature does not go higher than 400 degrees centigrade when it is being deposited. That gives it <clears throat> an added advantage of uh, depositing, depositing it on, 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 on chips or on devices which have already been fabricated uh, because temperature is not going to go beyond 400 degrees centigrade. Uh, that would mean that the uh, material devices uh, beneath uh, PECVD silicon nitride will stay intact. The heat will not uh, change it. Uh, that means that PECVD can be used in a very flexible way. Uh, the examples uh, shown here, uh, this first one shows a metal layer which was deposited uh, followed by deposition of oxide, then silicon nitride and all its processing. So there is a silicon, there is a waveguide layer on top of a metal layer in this case, it works like a mirror. So what you are seeing here are the grating, uh, um, are, uh, drag gratings made, made on a waveguide, which allows uh, light to be coupled in the waveguide. Uh, 
Uh, and this mirror actually helps in reflecting light from bottom back to these waveguides. So uh, this other example is shown where uh, this copper metal has been inserted right in the middle of a waveguide uh, to be used as a reflector. So you see that silicon nitride offers, because it's a deposited material, it offers lots of flexibility in being deposited um, multiple times. It's a low temperature process. That means it can be done multiple times without damaging devices beneath. Now in LPCVD, usually the temperature uh, involved is way higher and that reduces its flexibility about where all it can be deposited. If you compare it with silicon, uh, then silicon is even less uh, flexible in terms of its deposition because first of all, silicon uh, used in photonics is mainly a crystalline silicon, so it need to be grown um, and uh, that's why SOI wafers with a particular thickness of uh, silicon on, on insulator are used. There is a way to deposit uh, silicon uh, or at least polycrystalline silicon, but then the quality of that material is not that good and uh, that puts limits to how flexibly silicon can be used in terms of its uh, its deposition. Now, clad opening is another um, important thing in Biopix platform, uh, where after the deposition of oxide on top of waveguide as a, one of the final steps, uh, this oxide is completely removed from the top of waveguide. Um, so this allows uh, lots of uh, uh, applications, uh, mainly for uh, biosensing or chemical sensing. Uh, and then uh, uh, it, because it's only local removal of, of the oxide, that means that uh, uh, you are free to use rest of your chip area where you don't need removal of oxide in, 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 uh, in whatsoever way you uh, want. Um, and the another, uh, main feature of Biopix uh, is there are two different edge caps, um, which I explained before. You can see some of the devices made through it and, and, and it's different height. Now, uh, Biopix 300 and Biopix 150, I should make a distinction here. These are uh, two flavors of this platform. Uh, Biopix 300 means it's a 300 nanometer thick silicon nitride layer, which can be etched down to 150 nanometer or uh, completely. Biopix 150 is uh, another flavor of this platform, mainly targeted for uh, uh, visible uh, or uh, uh, even lower wavelengths. And that uh, starts with 150 nanometer thick silicon nitride and can be etched down to uh, uh, 60 nanometer, so 90 nanometer depth. Um, going, moving further. Yeah, so Biopix uh, platform is ready for versatile applications uh, because of these features. Features. Now, how reliable is Biopix? Uh, now, on that, uh, as uh, Maria explained before, that uh, silicon nitride MPW programs was uh, it, it evolved uh, with uh, with Pix for Life project. It was an EU project from uh, 2016 to 2020. It included 40 industrial and academic partners, and IMEC uh, organized six. Uh, early access fabrication run, uh, early access multi-project wafer um, uh, runs on uh, during this uh, uh, project. Uh, these runs allowed uh, reinforcing this platform by trying it again and again and tuning it to the to in, in the most optimized way. Uh, but after this uh, project got ended, uh, the, the silicon nitride MPW service became open access um, and uh, since uh, 2020, two MPW runs have been organized uh, on this platform so far uh, with Europractice and a lots of dedicated fabrication runs. So not really open for uh, participation through Europractice, but for customers uh, of IMEC uh, who use this platform under bilateral agreements. Uh, so all these different runs uh, have given a very good statistical data about uh, manufacturing as well as performance of these devices. So altogether, there has already been more than a dozen run um, and that has uh, given us a very good uh, understanding about uh, how well uh, these numbers which we show correspond to the actual manufacturing 
these are some images just to show that how things are refers uh, are uh, are measured. It's uh, meteorology happens uh, st statistically. The devices are measured and their propagation losses are uh, measured at wafer level over different fabrication runs to see that uh, um, are the propagation loss numbers are really what we claim to be and how much do they vary statistically. So all this uh, so many runs and the measurement of these uh, devices coming out of these runs have given us a very good statistical uh, idea about uh, how good Biopix platform is. Now there are two examples I'm going to show you uh, about uh, which are made on Biopix platform. Uh, what you are seeing here is a chip based uh, structured illumination microscopy. Uh, but if you just see in a, in a very broad way as a working principle, what is happening here? Uh, let, let's look at this slide first, this uh, image first. It shows that light can be put in through this Bragg grating, but then it is uh, cascadedly splitted again and again uh, to multiple times, finally converging into this spot where uh, the sample is to be kept. This is an actual picture of the chip where the light is inserted on this waveguide. It gets cascaded again and then finally all the light merges over here. So this kind of uh, structured illumination can be controlled uh, if these blue and red boxes uh, you see uh, uh, show different thermo-optic uh, um, tuners or different microheaters on top of waveguides. So by tuning this, by, by giving heat locally to these waveguides, we can control the phase of light going through it. So that means the light which finally uh, performs interference over here, uh, if the different lights have different phase, then you can control the interference pattern uh, like uh, shown over here. Uh, and by this, uh, you can actually control that what kind of um, interference pattern uh, forms where your sample is kept. And then it's uh, top down using top down microscopy. You can uh, investigate its uh, different properties. So the crux over here uh, in, in this device is that uh, an interfer interference based device was created and microheaters were used it, uh, in its different arms to control different phases. So this is a, a very popular um, kind of uh, technique used for so many different kind of applications uh, where you are simply uh, using uh, thermo optics to control the phase of waveguides and then eventually controlling the interference pattern. Now this uh, second example shows <coughs> chip based uh, Roman, uh, uh, sorry, chip based uh, Raman spectroscopy. Um, just to clarify on what's happening in this image, uh, this is basically uh, an imager, an, an imager chip with uh, 10 megapixel or so. Uh, what is happening uh, uh, here is that in light, uh, a laser is uh, uh, is made incident on a sample. Mostly the sample is an organic sample. Uh, the larger project over uh, in, in, in this example was to make a, a variable device which can measure uh, glucose. Uh, using a <coughs> Raman spectroscopy, so which can measure uh, glucose or sugar in your skin. Uh, and it was supposed to be a non-invasive way uh, because as you know, for now for diabetes patients, they need to really do an invasive technique to measure their uh, sugar. Either they have to draw out uh, blood uh, and that means you cannot really have real time monitoring of, uh, uh, of sugar uh, and this can be uh, very important for some people who are especially uh, suffering through acute uh, diabetes and all. Um, the idea over here was that uh, if we shine light directly on an organic sample and collect that reflect the reflected light back, then depending on the sugar uh, in blood, hence in skin, uh, there will be some non-linear interaction of that light, which would mean that the spectrum of uh, incoming light will change and what we collect back from the skin will have slightly different intensities for different wavelength than what was in an input light. Now the uh, to relate that uh, reflected light from skin uh, and uh, to relate with the quantity of sugar in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the skin, 
it requires some processing. It requires that that light spectrum should be again figured out. Uh, and one way to do is is that uh, the as you can see, light falls on the skin. It uses this uh, discrete optics to bring light back and shine it over the chip. Now that that chip is basically an imager with waveguides on top of it, and those waveguides are uh, there are many different kind of filters uh, made over there. Uh, so that means that uh, lights of different wavelengths will get resonated into different filters, and then you can make a inter uh, interferogram out of it with different cavity lengths for different filters and uh, different counts for the uh, <coughs> for the pixels activated from from light coming from on on top of it. Um, yes, so as you can see, uh, the interferogram. <laughs> can be um, uh, transformed uh, using Fourier transformation, and then that gives a Raman spectrometer. In this case, if the sample here was paracetamol, but uh, it can be many different kind of samples. And uh, further, by comparing these output uh, spectrums uh, with the level of uh, uh, the material which are being explored, uh, one can correlate uh, that uh, which spectrum corresponds to what level of uh, uh, material and hence uh, a non-invasive uh, spectrometer can be made, which can even be put uh, as a variable device. But the, the crux of it uh, where biopix comes into picture is this part where this uh, photonics uh, on CMOS imager was used. So this is a more uh, enlarged version of it. Uh, what you see that uh, incoming light, which is uh, uh, which comes through this discrete optics here, uh, falls on this uh, sloped metal, uh, which diverts light downwards. Uh, and these are the la uh, waveguide layers uh, of silicon nitride uh, shown here in green, uh, which takes light in uh, and uh, have it resonated in different kind of filters, and eventually sh uh, shoots it down to the imager. Um, so as I mentioned before, that Biopix allows flexible processing, and uh, what 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 is happening here is a commercial imager is used as a substrate for silicon nitride uh, waveguides and um, made into a, a variable uh, spectrometer basically so these are two of the uh, biopics applications uh, i wanted to mention now the question is how to access biopics um, now first of all it's not just true for biopics, but of course for uh, most of the photonics, uh, integrated photonics platforms, that you need to get access of process design kit or PDK. Now, what 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 is what are the usually constituents of a process design kit? Uh, when you get PDK, you usually get uh, different manuals which talks about the design technology and what all different components are provided in that PDK. It also contains uh, different uh, design rule check uh, scripts. Oh, sorry. This DRC script, it's very crucial um, in uh, integrated circuits uh, manufacturing or photonic integrated circuit manufacturing. These are the design rules about what layer can be on top of which layer, what should be the dimensions of different um, devices you can make on different layers. So all these rules uh, need to be checked, uh, of course, automatically because there are literally tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of devices and, and shapes. Um, my slides are extensions of their own moving quite fast. So uh, my apologies for that. OK, uh, PDK also includes uh, technology settings, um, which helps you to already preload uh, different kind of add-ins uh, in your uh, design software. And then it also includes different kind of uh, uh, building blocks, uh, different kind of devices whose designs have already been uh, made, manufactured and tested. And most of these uh, and this uh, Biopix PDK can be used uh, with the Lucida software <coughs> for photonics designing as well as um, <coughs> software from Synopsys. So this is if you get Biopix PDK, this is what you will uh, get into it. And in general, uh, uh, PDK makes designing much more efficient and faster. That's a message to take from this slide. Now, how to access Biopix? Uh, what are the administrative steps? So the step first is to go and visit Euro Practice website. There are lots of technical details about all technologies which are mentioned over here. There, um, on the same website, you will find a design kit license agreement. 
this is the agreement uh, between um, Foundry and, and you, which will give you access to the PDK, which we have previously talked about. So once you have access to PDK, uh, you can download the process design kit and already start designing. You can see that um, whether this platform is for your needs or not. Um, and uh, do you already have, uh, you can play with it and uh, already uh, investigate different aspects of it. Uh, you can also uh, check on your practice website about the schedule of uh, upcoming MPW runs and uh, <clears throat> they happen uh, a few times a year uh, for silicon and silicon nitride. So if you think you will be able to submit design in a particular uh, um, MPW run, then you can again go to the registration website maintained by your practice where you can register for that run and uh, when the deadline arrives, you should you should have your design ready and then it will be checked for different design rule violations uh, by by the foundry before it is sent for manufacturing. Now this was pretty much uh, all about silicon uh, nitride and biopics in particular, but uh, it is important to contrast it with silicon photonics and that's also something uh, uh, it, you will find in continuation with the next webinar on, on silicon photonics technology. So we already tried to build a case for silicon nitride in the beginning against uh, silicon photonics. And as I said, both of them have different pros and cons. So let's summarize it that uh, when should you use silicon nitride and when silicon photonics? So first of all, uh, you see in terms of wavelength range. Uh, now in terms of wavelength range, uh, silicon nitride has an edge over silicon photonics because uh, uh, up to 400 nanometer uh, uh, from 400 nanometer to 4000 nanometer is covered in silicon nitride actually the wave, um, even larger wavelengths uh, these materials are transparent for even larger wavelengths than 4000 nanometer but here i have put 4000 nanometer as a number because uh, in almost all kind of uh, integrated photonics it's usually silicon dioxide which is put on top of uh, these layers, at least for silicon and silicon nitride. And then uh, wavelengths above 4000 uh, nanometer does not uh, do very well with silicon dioxide. So silicon dioxide puts an upper limit on what lights can be used on, on, on these things. If you are, of course, uh, using a waveguide uh, with no cladding on top of it, then uh, your application range can be even for higher wavelengths. So here silicon nitride has a very clear advantage. But then if you see in terms of refractive index, then silicon dioxide has a higher refractive index than silicon nitride. Uh, what does it mean? That means that you can make even more compact waveguides uh, uh, than, than, than silicon nitride. And uh, if you have even a higher wavelength uh, refractive index, then the waveguide can be even smaller. So in terms of compactness, uh, silicon has a, a big edge over silicon nitride. If you look at waveguide loss, then silicon nitride has done very well. Uh, it's uh, depending what material you're using and what, what architecture, it can have very low loss going down to 0 0.001 dB per centimeter, while for silicon photonics, even though it has been shown to have even lesser um, uh, loss in silicon, but typically it ranges from 1 to 1.5 uh, dB per centimeter. Now, nonlinear processes, that is very interesting because there is no one parameter on which we can measure which has which is better for nonlinear uh, applications. Uh, for example, silicon has a higher care uh, coefficient than silicon nitride, uh, but it also has uh, two photon absorptions. So uh, uh, if you compare in terms of uh, which material you want to choose for silicon nitride uh, for uh, uh, nonlinear Thinks uh, it's a kind of a subjective question, but usually uh, silicon nitride is preferred uh, for uh, many kind of nonlinear uh, applications like um, uh, supercontinuum generation or uh, uh, frequency combing, and so on. Um, thermo optic coefficient. Now here I have given thumbs up to silicon nitride because it has lower thermo optic coefficient, which means its waveguides are less sensitive to heat than silicon waveguides, but uh, you can very well give thumbs up to silicon also in that sense for the very same reason that it has a higher thermo optic coefficient, which means you can have more efficient microheaters on, on silicon waveguides and uh, perform all kind of uh, thermo optic switching uh, in that. 
so again, it depends on the perspective. What you are looking for um, gives uh, you uh, a thumbs up or thumbs down for if you compare between these two materials. Then uh, doping uh, of implants of ions is not possible in silicon nitride, uh, uh, but for silicon, of course, it is possible. That's why the whole that's the reason why the whole um, electronics industry is is based on on that thing. Um, now by uh, doping these waveguides and then electrically contacting them, you can change its refractive index uh, by passing electricity through them. And that's a bit largely the principle based on which uh, many uh, moderators are made. And um, as you can see that the modulation speed is all can be of many tens of GB per second um, in the case of silicon. While for silicon nitride, at best you can either use thermo optic modulation, which will not be very fast, uh, maybe in the range of few kilohertz, uh, or uh, you do some more fancy uh, material introduction on along with silicon nitride waveguides to make uh, an, uh, an efficient uh, modulator in that. Uh, same applies to integrated photo detectors. Uh, silicon uh, yeah, works very well with germanium and germanium photo detectors are, um, are, are, are very popular uh, where uh, they can uh, high speed uh, detectors can be made and integrated on silicon waveguides. That's not possible with silicon nitride uh, since it's a amorphous material and the lattice matching does not happen. And finally, uh, layer stack flexibility. So here you can guess it that uh, silicon nitride has an obvious advantage over silicon um, because uh, it can be deposited wherever you want, especially if it is a PECVD silicon nitride. So the lesson from this slide is that silicon and silicon nitride both offers excellent platforms, but depending on what your requirements are. There are examples where both materials are used in, in a chip, where uh, in, in multi-layer photonics, for example, uh, silicon can be used for the layer where you want to do all kinds of operations. Uh, modulation, detection, switching and all. While when it comes to just passive waveguides where light is just traveling through uh, photonic wires, then that layer is made up of silicon nitride. So there are examples where both of these materials work together and uh, of course um, uh, work separately in, in their own uh, right. So uh, that was it. Uh, uh, 24 to biopics and also to silicon nitride um, photonic integrated circuits in general. Um, thank you for uh, your time. And now, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask.